All right, it's time for chapter nine. Remember that big thing that happened at the end of chapter eight? That big thing was the man in the yellow suit, whose name we do not know, was spying on the tux and he heard the entire story about how they have lived forever. So that's um, how we ended on chapter eight. So let's go ahead and get started on chapter nine. Okay. Page 24. The August sun rolled up, hung in mid-heaven for a blinding hour, and at last wheeled westward before the journey was done. But when he was exhausted long before that, Miles carried her some of the way. The tops of her cheeks were bright pink with sunburn, her nose a vivid comic red. But she had been rescued from a more serious broiling by May, who had finally, in who had finally insisted that she wear the blue straw hat. It came down far over her ears and gave her a clownish appearance. But the shade from its brim was so welcome that when he put vanity aside and dozed gratefully in Miles' strong arms, her own arms wound round around his neck. The pastures, fields, and scrubby groves they crossed were vigorous with bees and crickets, and crickets leapt before them as if each step released a spring and flung up like pep flung them up like pebbles. Man, I'm messing up a lot, I'm sorry. But everything else was motionless, dry as a biscuit. Ooh, there's some figurative language. Dry as biscuit. See if you know what that is. Dry as biscuit. A simile. If you said simile you're right. On the brink of burning, hoarding final re reservoirs of sap, trying to hold out till the rain returned, and Queen Anne's lace lay dusty on the surface of the meadows like foam on a painted sea. Now, Queen Anne's lace, um, it's a really pretty flower. It's like little white flowers. So there's no queen in the field. There's no lace in the field. Queen Anne's lace is like a flower. We're in the middle of page 24. It was amazing then to climb a long hill to see another ahead another hill, and beyond that the deep green of scattered pine forest. And as you climb to feel the air ease and soften, when he re revived sniffing and was able to ride the horse again, perched behind May, and to her oft-repeated question, Are we almost there yet? The welcome answer came at last. Only a few more minutes now. A wide stand of dark pines rose up, looming near, and suddenly Jesse was crying. We're home! This is it, Winnie Foster! And he and Miles raced on and disappeared among the trees. The horse followed, turning onto a rutted path, lumpy with roots, and it was as if they had slipped in under a giant col colander. The late sun's brilliance could penetrate only in scattered glimmers, and everything was silent and untouched. The ground muffled with moss and sliding needles, the graceful arms of the pine stretched out protectively in every direction. And it was cool, blessedly cool and green. The horse picked his way carefully, and then ahead the path dropped down a steep emb embankment. And beyond that, Winnie, peering around May's bulk, saw a flash of color and a dazzling sparkle. Down the embankment they swayed, and there it was, a plain, homely little house, barn red, and below it, the last of the sun flashing on the wrinkled surface of tiny lake. Oh, look, cried Winnie, water! At the same time, they heard two enormous splashes, two voices roaring with pleasure. It don't take them more than a minute to pile into that pond, said May, beaming. Well, you can't blame them in a heat like this. You can go in, too, if you want. Then they were at the door of the little house, and Tuck was standing there. "'Where's the child?' he demanded, for Winnie was hidden behind his wife. "'The boys say you brung along a real honest-to-goodness natural child.' "'So I did,' said May, sliding down off the horse, and here she is. Winnie's shyness returned at once when she saw the big man with his sad face and baggy trousers. But he gazed at her, the warm, pleasing feeling spreading through her again. For Tuck's head tilted to one side, his eyes went soft, and the gentlest smile in the world displaced the melancholy creases of his cheeks. He reached up to lift her from the horse's back, and he said, There's just no words to tell you how happy I am to see you. It's the finest thing that's happened in... He interrupted himself, setting Winnie on the ground, and turned to May. Does she know? 
Okay, so Tuck is this like big old burly man. And in the first chapter, we or in the second chapter, when we were introduced to May, he kind of seemed like he was, you know, angry at the world and grumpy. But then it seems as though Winnie has like totally changed his attitude. He's happy. He's excited to see her. And he's kind of like a big old teddy bear. We also had a vocabulary word that you had in your first dictionary detective, melancholy. Um, and remember, melancholy means like sad and down. So um, that sentence said, for Tuck's head tilted to one side, his eyes went soft and the gentlest smile in the world displaced the melancholy creases of his cheeks. So like the sad and lowly creases of his cheeks were replaced by his smile. Okay, so we're on the second to last paragraph on page 25. Of course she knows, said May. That's why I brung her back. Winnie, here's my husband, Angus Tuck. Tuck, meet Winnie Foster. How do, Winnie Foster, said Tuck, shaking Winnie's hand rather solemnly. Well then, he straightened and peered down at her. And Winnie, looking back into his face, saw an expression there that made her feel like an unexpected present, wrapped in pretty paper and tied with ribbons. In spite of May's blue hat, which still enveloped her head. Well then, Tuck repeated, seeing you know, I'll go and say this is the finest thing that's happened in, oh, at least 80 years. Okay, so chapter nine takes them through the journey of getting to the Tuck's house. Okay, you have several things that you pass going to the Tuck's house. So um, I want you first to go to... Um, to Google Maps, and I want you to put in your address, okay? A lot, of, or I actually want you to go to MapQuest. So you're gonna go to MapQuest, and I'll put that on um, Shobi so you can see it. And I want you to put in your address, okay? And then you can also put in the school's address. You'll have to look that up, okay? So you'll put in the school's address and your house's address. Now, when you do that and you hit get directions, it'll give you all these directions to get to your house, okay? And it's in order. I mean, you're not going to go, um, you're not going to turn on your street before you leave the school's parking lot. So you have to do things in order, in sequential order. So what you're going to do is you're going to write directions, and you can make it look just like it does on MapQuest. You're going to write directions from where they were by um, the stream in chapter eight to the Tuck's house. It starts out that they are, um, they're going westward. Then they pass pastures and fields and scrubby groves. So you need to explain each one of those steps that they're passing by before they get to the Tuck's house. You also need to put the landmark that is right next to the Tuck's house that they talk about Miles and Jesse going to right when they first get to the house. So go to MapQuest, put in your address and the school's address. You'll have to Google that. And I want you to use that as an, that as an example. Um, you're not going to write any of those things, but that's your example because you're going to then do that, but you're going to do it from the stream that they were at to the Tuck's house. So you need to put... Um, all the different things that they pass. Okay, yours isn't going to say right on Sandy Lake Drive. Yours is going to say um, up a long hill. Okay, or yours is going to say down the embankment. Okay, so write me directions from the stream to the Tuck's house. Um, you're going to do this. You can do it on the white paper that I will make sure is back on the counter. So not notebook paper, but just use white computer paper and then turn it in when you're finished.